Today I want to uh, look at my old field work in a new way. And I'm doing a bit of a dangerous thing because I, uh, well, I thought I had an extra week to present this for one, so this is, this is awfully quickly put together. But consumption is a tremendous body of literature in anthropology. It, uh, in the 1970s, became kind of a hot topic. In the 90s, it just mushroomed, it exploded. Uh, and it's kind of looking at uh, kind of a, a swinging of a pendulum in anthropology. At one time, so much of anthropological in literature was focused on the mode of production in terms of material, in terms of the relationship with the environment, also in terms of what the worker is doing and how they're contributing to society. And there's different arguments for the reason behind it, but uh, I wanted to look at consumption at the level of, you know, okay, the goods have been produced and people then consume it after it's been distributed. What's the meaning behind this? Okay, what's the meaning behind what we consume? So, let me also say that uh, the Quaker guy on the oats there, this is actually not a Quaker organization. The person who founded this organization was uh, the recipient of kindness from a Quaker person. And he was so impressed by the generosity of Quakers that he decided to name his, his company after them. So that's kind of the quick his story behind that guy. My field work was conducted in Scotland. Uh, the formal field work, my taking notes and my being dil diligent and being a participant observer, doing surveys, doing interviews, happened between 1997 and 1998. But it's also important to stress that I lived in, in my field site since, uh, I, well into 2003. So while I wasn't formally taking notes at that time, they were still informing me, they were still they became friends, basically, in a small F, not a capital F. My field notes, learning from them continued. I focused on Quaker meetings in Scotland, which is what's depicted here. Uh, all of these black dots are uh, areas where there is a, a Quaker meeting. There are only about 1,000 Quakers in Scotland. Uh, there are only about 18,000 in all of the UK. So not a very big religious group. Uh, they, the reason I chose Britain was because originated from Britain. Uh, the reason I chose Scotland was because logistically the, it was easier for me to do so. It was also more easily contained. So the, the logistics of field work is important. The topic of my PhD is the way this group of people who aspire to be pacifists manage conflicts amongst themselves? How do they use their religious understanding to manage those, those problems in their lives? Uh, my, t my talk today, however, is going to be more focused on identity and what they do uh, as Quakers to, to feel like they're Quakers. All right? While I was in field work, there was an astonishing array of things happening in Britain. It was really an exhilarating, exciting time to be in the UK. Uh, uh, there was a change of government shortly after I arrived. All of the Tory party in Scotland was kicked out of office. All right? There was a thing called the poll tax that Margaret Thatcher implemented on only Scotland for a while, and this, the Scots resented this. And so uh, at the 96 election, all of the Tories were just basically kicked out of, of Scottish government, Scottish politics. Uh, the death of Diana, Princess Diana occurred, changing the way even the royalty understands its, its mourning and uh, saying this is a private affair, but the public insisting, no, it's ours. Dolly the sheep was born and died while I was in Scotland. Uh, I didn't do it, right? <laughs> uh, we also see the implementation of the Scottish Parliament, uh, the devolution of Parliament. This is the queen dressed in uh, thistle lavender, kind of purple, pink, uh, being in the Scottish Parliament. It was a very interesting time. As I was writing up, and sorry, this is probably going to disturb your pizza. Uh, while I was writing up, there was the foot and mouth crisis in, in the UK. Uh, foot and mouth is a disease that affects cloven hooved animals. Uh, and what's interesting is it doesn't kill the animal. It makes them very uncomfortable, but they're able to survive it. 
the thing is, it's incredibly virulent. It's very contagious. And they were afraid of this. Uh, they trace it to uh, illegally imported meats coming into a particular Chinese restaurant. And from that meat, it somehow spread into the, the, the farms of England. Uh, the reason I wanted to point this out is while I was, there's a little plaque. This right here are pyres. These are pyres that are basically burning the carcasses. Um, within this particular location, you can't really read it here, over 450,000 sheep were, were killed, were euthanized, I guess you could say. Um, about 20,000 cattle, about 8,000 goats. And while this was happening, I was at a, a news agent, a kind of a local shop. And the gentleman there uh, who ran the shop, he and I became good friends, was from Pakistan. And he looked at the headlines and he just shook his head. He says, this is an incredibly affluent country. He says, if this happens in a, in a farm in Pakistan, you take that one sheep, you pull it aside, you slaughter it, and you have lamb. You have mutton that night. You don't kill the whole herd. And here, England was slaughtering all these animals. And it goes to show that Britain's an affluent society, that it can be so quick to destroy its food. All right? Granted, it is a concern, a health concern, but it doesn't affect humans at all. And it, uh, it apparently is fine meat if you're, if you're hungry for it. But it, 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 it kicked up something in my mind that, yes, this is an affluent society. And what's interesting about affluent societies is you have choice. You have the ability to choose what you consume and what you don't consume. Maybe you chose Diet Coke, Coke, water, pepperoni, cheese, you know, okay? We have these sorts of things that we can choose. We can choose our clothing. We can choose where we live to some extent. And so this has interesting implications. What helps guide that choice from a cultural standpoint? What in our culture helps us, encourages us to make our choices? So an affluent society. As I've already stated, consumption in anthropology is a hot topic, has been for well over oh, 30 years now. Uh, I kind of follow some of the ideas of an anthropologist named James Carrier, who is looking at this in terms of, uh, originally in terms of identity, but then he starts moving into social classes. He looks especially at the consumption and how consumption is constrained by the state in choosing where you're going to live, especially in <coughs> relation to class and race. Okay, I'm not going to go into to lodging. I'm going to look more into how food expresses who we are or ho who these people are in terms of identity. Oops in terms of their identity as uh, religious practitioners, all right? My question, how does a group who de-emphasizes meaning and consumerism make choices about consumption, all right? Affluence, choice, and consumption. When we look at consumption in anthropology, many anthropologists like to go with the idea of commodities. This has been an idea that's been around since the 1930s, a man named Marcel Mauss brings this up in, in relation to what happens when a gift is given, all right? And what happens when a gift is given is you form a relationship. You kind of establish a, uh, an exchange system that says, I like you or I want to like you more. Here's a gift, and I'll expect something in the, in the future from you, okay? So it, ex it, it, establishes, uh, it establishes obligation. Commodities are mass-produced items in our society. These are things that really have no marker. Uh, how many pizzas get made today? You know, why are these pizzas significant to us? You know, they're mass-produced items. Think about all those bags of potato chips and all those M&Ms that are in a Target store. Think about all those items that really have no identity to them whatsoever. But somehow, there is a process where we take these items we take them to our homes, we appropriate them. That's what we have here next. We appropriate them. There's something about the item, the mass-produced item, that says something about us or will say something about us if we play with it a little bit, okay? And so the idea of appropriation is taking purchase, going out and putting in effort to purchase goods, all right? To purchase goods, the time, the energy. How many people go to more than one grocery store to get all of your grocery needs taken care of. It might be because there's a sale, you're looking for value. It might be because that grocery store doesn't carry a particular brand that I like more. 
right? So appropriation <laughs> happens through the purchase. And then if you think of it in terms of food, when you prepare the food and give it to your family or you give it to friends, you've done something to that. You bake cookies, all right? You bake cookies. You've mixed the, the batter. You've mixed the dough. You've made that something that's yours. You've, you've become invested in it. And you give it away, all right? When you, give the, when you invest at the level of appropriation, it becomes a possession, okay? It becomes a possession. It becomes yours. All of a sudden, that, this jacket that becomes mass-produced becomes mine because it reflects something about me, all right? So materials linked to the self, this, this notion of possession, these are materials that are linked to the self, to our own identities. Now, let me give you some background on my field work, the folks that I did the field work with. The Religious Society of Friends, an astonishing group. There, there aren't very many of them, but their influence in British society is considerably disproportionate. They're very influential politically. They're known for theological diversity. They don't have a common statement that you have to believe this to become a Quaker, all right? And you'll find Quakers that will go to a Catholic Mass, and then after Catholic Mass, they go to Quaker service. They go to a Quaker worship. Uh, you'll have people that will be sitting in the worship session in a lotus position, doing meditation, right? Who would identify themselves as a Buddhist, but they also are Quaker. And the Quaker group the, the won't say, you got it wrong, man, you need to leave, okay? And so, incredibly diverse theologically. They do not proselytize. They aren't standing out on corners saying, hey, have you found God? They don't make these sorts of, of efforts. Uh, they tend to persuade people that are aware of some quality about them. Quakers at one time looked like the guy on the oatmeal box. They don't look this way anymore. Here we go. This is a, this is a depiction of a Quaker meeting. Uh, uh, in Ealing. Uh, this is down in England, actually. These are a bunch of people. Notice there isn't a pulpit. There isn't a, these are people who are all kind of oriented, looking at each other, or they sit with their eyes closed. They sit and worship in silence. Now, and I'll get into that in a moment. There's a quality about a Quaker that you'll see that they'll do something that will go against the mainstream. And for those people who are like, you know, I really admire the integrity of that person over there. What is that about them? And they'll ask sometimes. They'll find the audacity to ask, and they'll, they'll get the response, well, I do this because this is what I believe in. This is what my faith says I should do. What's your faith? I'm a Quaker. And you'll get lots of sorts of responses. I didn't know they were still around, you know, and then you get all these sorts of things. The things that a Quaker orients their life by are the things known as the testimonies. Truth. A Quaker has to be truthful in what they say. Uh, it's against their religion to swear an oath. An oath says, hey, right now, I can say anything I want and I'm going to, but at this moment, in this courtroom, before all these people and after my hands on the Bible, I swear that this is the truth. A Quaker finds this hypocritical. And they can be very brusque sometimes. They'll be very direct and you feel kind of like you've just been rubbed the wrong way, but it was just them being honest. And if you, if you ask them, you know, how do I look in this, and they don't like it, you might get that direct answer, or you might just kind of Quaker silence, right? <laughs> Equality. Everyone is equal, all right? Everyone is equal. Everyone in a Quaker meeting, everyone outside the Quaker meeting, and they try to guide their lives according to this. So they will refuse to uh, use titles. It's astonishing. I was sitting next to uh, some very, very bright people when I was doing my field one. One person mathematically discovered quasars before they were discovered in the sky, right? I knew her as Jocelyn, okay? I didn't know this until well into my field work. Had I known right up front that this person is this impressive of an astronomer, I probably would never have approached them. It would have been just too much. It was like, oh gosh, that's a big brain. I won't deal with that. The head of the medical school at the nearby university, I knew him as John, right? They don't use these sorts of titles in their, in their lives. Uh, it becomes an interesting thing on campus. You could call him John and they wouldn't, they wouldn't be, he wouldn't be upset even though he was 
Dean Phillips. Simplicity, and this is, the, this is one that we'll hit on uh, in a moment. Simplicity, living a life of simplicity means not over-consuming. It means not going out and buying something that you don't really need. And they're very tight with the way they did, uh, understand need as well. Yes, I need this Armani suit. No, you don't, right? And then, of course, peace. This is one of the things that pulled me to the Society of Friends as a researcher, was how do they implement this in conflict situations? In worship, okay, a Quaker on Sunday will gather in what's known as a meeting for worship. They don't go to churches. Let me stress here that these are Quakers in Britain. There are Quakers here in the Midwest and in the, on the West Coast that have churches. Uh, there are lots of different varieties in, in the United States. Because of that notion of equality, there are no priests or pastors. It is your responsibility to understand what God has intent for, intended for you. It's your responsibility to read the Bible. It's your responsibility to read the Koran, to read the religious texts of any sort of, of, of group. No creeds. There is no statement that says, this is what you are, and this is what I believe, and this is what makes me a Quaker. So that's really fuzzy around the edges. There is no real sharp distinction of in Quaker identity that says, I'm a Quaker and you're not, right? Like you will see in other faiths, for instance, where they have creeds or where they, you know, I am a Catholic and you aren't. This is pretty easy to delineate, all right? Well, for Quakers, it's not that simple. There's no set service. They guide their worship on the idea of the inner light. And this is the understanding that there is a bit of God in every human being. Every human being has a bit of God within them. And it's their ambition to address that. Because everybody has that bit of God, right? Everyone's equal. Okay? Because everybody has that bit of God, harming that other person is harming the truth that that person has and harming God. Peace testimony. Right? So... There's no set service, and what they do, here's a nice pretty uh, uh, sculpture showing Quaker meeting for worship, where people gather, usually sitting in a circle, and they sit in silence waiting for the inner light to give them some sort of inspiration, some sort of truth. And if they hear it, they call it the still small voice. Other faiths use this as well, but that still small voice within you, if it says something, you stand up, you talk, and you sit down. Ideally, it's very brief. And this is what usually is accompanied, at one time especially, accompanied with quaking. This is where they get the name Quaker, because they quaked in the presence of the truth or of God. You don't see quaking so much anymore. In the United States, you do. It's actually a desirable sort of, of uh, expression of being in contact with God. I'll pass this around. Uh, this is Quaker faith and practice. This is basically kind of a, a guidebook for how to do it how to organize a Quaker meeting, the experience that other Quakers in Quaker history have, have understood what their faith is. There's also a list in there <coughs> called uh, the advices and queries. And this is, this is within the bigger book, but this is a small version. And it's just a list of questions. A lot of people in the Society of Friends actually memorize these, or they take one of these and they keep it in their pocket, and they have it with them a lot and they'll sit and they'll meditate on these. So I'll pass that around as well. I'll give you a, a, several ex instances of these in a moment. So it's a compilation of Quaker experiences, and it is amazing the way they put this together. Uh, drafts of the book will get distributed to all of the local meetings in the UK, and they'll say, yes, we like this, no, we don't. And they'll send their recommendations to the regional level and then they'll take those under consideration. They call it discernment. And then they take that to the, the central body, the central governance body. And they basically, they edit it about every 20, 30 years now. They'll edit it. And they'll, they'll take in other quotes. They'll, they'll add new voices. There's this idea. God's within every person. When they stand up and speak, that's truth. And this would be regarded as a continuing revelation. The truth didn't stop with the Bible. It didn't stop with the Bible. It actually continues on through the living God uh, in society. You have to be careful, though. You can't just stand up and say, hey, I got God's truth, and you give some sort of erratic response. It does happen, but they then discern. It's like, well, is that really what God intends for us? And it becomes 
uh, attention between the individual and the corporate group is very interesting. Again, that's the that's PhD. Sneaking out here, sorry. Oh. Holy smokes. I didn't realize it would look that big on the screen. Let me read this for you. Well, I'll read the first paragraph. The heart of Quaker ethics is summed up in the word simplicity. Simplicity is the forgetfulness of self and remembrance of our humble status as waiting servants of God. Outwardly, simplicity is shunning superfluities of dress, speech, behavior, and possessions which tend to obscure our vision of reality. Inwardly, simplicity is the spiritual detachment from the things of this world as a part of the effort to fulfill the first commandment, to love God with all of the heart and mind and strength. All right? This is what is going to culturally influence a Quaker's decision making when they go to the grocery store. Okay? These, this isn't the only one. I mean, it goes on. Here's another. <clears throat> oh, there's a story with this one, too. It is our tender and Christian advice that friends take care to keep to truth and plainness in language, habit, deportment, and behavior. That simply, that simplicity of truth in these things may not wear out, nor be lost in our days, nor in our posterities. And to avoid pride and immodesty in apparel and all vain and superfluous fashions of the world. 1691. How about that? Uh, actually, this isn't the one that has the story. Uh, the advice is in queries. Uh, we'll get to it in a moment. It's the individual experience. That's the little pamphlet that a person will take around with them or they'll memorize and they'll kind of contemplate when they're sitting in silence at home. Try to live simply. A simple lifestyle freely chosen is a source of strength. Do not be persuaded into buying what you do not need or cannot afford. This is advice that uh, our society could use right now, couldn't it? Do you keep yourself informed about the effects of your style of living is having on the global economy and environment? So this is establishing a sensitivity to the inner light, not just in the people that are in the room with you every Sunday, but the inner light of the person who's picking the tea or picking the coffee on the other side of the world. Okay. Consider which of the ways to happiness offered by society are truly fulfilling and which are potentially corrupting and destructive. Be discriminating when choosing means of entertainment and information. Resist the desire to acquire possessions or income through unethical investment speculation or games of chance. Okay. In the Quaker faith and practice, there is a section that is basically the individual testimonies of people. This is how I experience the simplicity testimony. And they give a, a little anecdote. Uh, and these are what Quakers then decide, should this be included in the next edition or is there something better that's come up since? Uh, not all Quakers are vegetarian, okay? Some have decided to be so. And this is going back to that notion that it takes an affluent society to turn down food, right? If you think about it, vegetarianism is, you know, there's plenty of food choices out there, but I'm choosing not to take part in that type of food. This is interesting. If it is right that we should show love and compassion for people, surely it is right that we should extend our love and compassion to animals. Who can feel fear and experience pain in much the same way as humans? They may not be able to speak, but we can certainly see fear in their eyes and demeanor. I feel that being a vegetarian is a natural progression from being a pacifist and a Quaker. Before I had come acquainted, become acquainted with this, this passage, there was a local festival that the meeting house where I did field work took part in, and they kind of converted their, their meeting house into a theater, and they had a cafe in it. It ran for three weeks, and it was all done by volunteers from all over the world, actually, but mostly from the UK. And it's very intense, and the, the cafe is vegetarian, and when you get all these strangers together, you put them in an intense situation, and you take away red meat from their diet, they can tend to be a bit ouchy with each other. Towards the end of the three weeks, they're, they're wanting their red meat if they aren't accustomed to a, a strictly vegetarian diet. And there was one person who brought in some catering and a friend of mine, and she, it was prepared, the, it was the meal that was prepared for the volunteers. And she asked if I was going to eat there that night. And I thought we were alone. I said, no, I need to go home and eat something that once had a heartbeat. 
<laughs> and back of me was a very, very strict vegan. <laughs> and she wasn't very happy. I didn't make friends with that person on that. <laughs> so, a little faux pas for the anthropologist. Uh, just, uh, just to show that, that one, this person has established ten rules for living. Uh, find things for their usefulness, not their status. Uh, reject anything that's producing an addiction in you. Give things away. This is, gosh, this sounds like, uh, you know, give things away and create prestige, you know. Yeah. Fourth, refuse to be propagandized by the custodians of modern gadgetry. That's yeah, great, though. <laughs> <laughs> Learn to enjoy things without owning them. I don't own this, so that, uh, but I'm not a Quaker, so I don't have to hear this. Look with healthy skepticism at all buy now, pay later schemes. Again, something else for, for our society. Uh, obey Jesus' injunction about plain, honest speech. Reject anything that will breed op oppression of other people. I should have read. And shun what should distract you from the main goal. Now, on Sunday mornings, what happens? Okay, Quakers come together. Uh, the meeting house that I, I did my field work with usually had about 70, sometimes, you know, averaging 70 participants. So 70 people come to, into this room, they sit in a circle. Uh, on the center table, uh, on the center table, they'll have a thing of flowers usually. Uh, they'll have Quaker faith and practice, they'll have a Bible. It was interesting, after 9-11, uh, they also for about a year had the Koran on the table as well, which I found interesting. Uh, at the beginning of the meeting for worship, as soon as the first person enters that room, the silence begins and worship begins. And they sit down quietly. You don't talk. You don't wave at somebody when you step in the meeting room. And they sit down and it's known as settling down. You just kind of let, you know, the difficulties you had in parking your car, you let that melt away. The screaming kids, what's going on outside. You just let all those uh, distracting thoughts just kind of fly off, and you center down and hopefully have an experience with that inner light to get a, a, an attachment or a, a, an instance of truth. If that happens, they call it a ministry. Uh, you basically will stand up briefly saying what you believe or what you feel is truth and sit back down. And some people might respond to that. Others, you know, it might just go back into silence. Uh, if it's an hour-long silence, they're completely all right with that. That is a communion for them. Seventy participants. At the end of the meeting for worship, because children have some difficulty with the discipline of sitting quietly for an hour, they kind of reserve the last 15 minutes for the children to come in and try and experience the meaning of, of silence in their, in their worship service. Some things I want you to take note of. Apart from the orientation of the room, where everybody's sitting in a circle and kind of directed towards each other, there's no symbolism here. There's no cross to identify this as a Christian organization. There aren't any stained glass windows. It's just a very simple, straightforward room. In fact, during the week, this room gets rented out to yoga groups and foreign language groups, tr railway, tra train societies, all sorts of groups actually will rent this room for their, for their meeting. After, after, well, there are two people here. There's one that's an overseer and one that's an elder. And you don't see it in the photograph, but over on this wall over here, there's a clock. And they're making sure that the, the meeting for worship lasts for about an hour. And they're there to kind of maintain the structure of the silence, ensuring that it's, that it's a Quaker event, if you will. When they're at the end of an hour, they shake hands, and that signals the end of worship. And then everybody can say, well, hi, how are you? start being more, more sociable in a vocal way. Afterwards, they go to uh, coffee and fellowship in the room down below. Uh, about 15, 52, per, uh, 52 people get involved in this after meeting for worship. Uh, the difference, this is smack dab in the middle of tourist territory. And so they get a lot of tourists coming in. And some of them don't stick around afterwards. Some people don't want to be a part of the, the, the fellowship and coffee, so they choose not to. Um, the cost of a coffee or a tea is about 20p. At the time, it was around 35 cents, maybe 30. Uh, 
after that, they have lunch, and it's a communal meal. They have lunch together, and it usually involves soup, uh, cheese, and homemade bread. And we'll get to that in a minute. It isn't a gift, but the price, basically, it's cheap. If you can't afford it, you're a student, you're a graduate student, and you're starving, they won't look their nose down at you if you walk by the collection tray for the, for the soup. So in that instance, it is a gift. But uh, if you can't afford it, it's thought that 60 cents or, or 35p would be a, a, an appropriate donation or, or payment. Uh, yeah. It's at this time that, that being a Quaker is interesting, right? Because of the tricks that all the rules that you have to put together on how to make a soup for all of these people who believe that vegan is the way to go, that vegetarian is the way to go, that you know buying fair trade is the way to go. So let's let's go into that. Remember that Quaker identity it minimizes symbolism. They actually the way you represent yourself as a Quaker is by doing. Okay, you do it, you, and you'll be seen doing it if you can. You don't trumpet it. You don't. You don't show any sort of boastful pride, saying, "You know, I bought all my wardrobe at a used clothing store." You don't do that sort of thing. You just do it. Again, uh, this is a uh, depiction of Jesus in the inner light, uh, wherever I am gathered, uh, wherever there are more believers, three or more believers gathered. I'm not good with the Bible verse. Uh, there I am as well. Uh, Quaker dress, this is 17th century, uh, wear the Quaker gray and the women in bonnets, quite like what we would see the Amish wearing today. Very, very obvious at this time that this person was a Quaker, not only in the way they dressed, but also in the way they spoke. They didn't use the word you and I, it was thee and thou, because you and I were thought to be proud and boastful, thee and thou was very humbling. So at one time, it was very, very stark contrast. I'm a Quaker and you're not. They got rid of these when they realized, they, they called them the peculiarities. They got rid of these when they realized that people were not uh, <coughs> staying in the Society of Friends. They were endogamous. If you married someone who wasn't a Quaker, then you were, then you were kicked out of the Society of Friends if you couldn't convince the person to, to convert. So they dropped all these sort of strict uh, symbols of, of representing who they are. Again, uh, the dress, the, the mode of worship was all to reflect the, the <coughs> testimonies as they understood them. Uh, this influences, of course, the, the, the mode of dress, what you consume. There are certain fabrics that you're not going to purchase. There are certain uh, foods that won't be available to you even back then. Uh, because they were so insular, partly because of the hostility of the people outside, they became very important uh, trade relationships, partnerships within the Society of Friends. And people, they actually became very wealthy, uh, selling goods to others. Uh, Lloyd's and Barclays, oops. Lloyd's and Barclays were good at selling money to other people. Uh, these are both very big banks, of course. They were Quaker institutions at one time. Uh, Cad Cadbury and Roundtree are both good because uh, Quaker organizations, they focused on sweets. They were, they were brutal businessmen. Uh, there's an interesting book out that, that discusses how Roundtree was really a chocolate cartel. He would go and there would be these little chocolate industries, these little factories making chocolates and he'd buy them out. Very hostile, hostile uh, overrunning of the, of the field. Roundtree isn't as big as the Cadbury is. Cadbury you can still uh, is, gets imported here. Clark's, how many people wearing Clark's shoes? That was a Quaker organization. They just recently uh, changed their structure uh, away from the Quaker method of making decisions uh, within like the last oh, 10, 15 years. But these actually are very big businesses that set up families to be awfully affluent. The generation after the round, the, the early uh, entrepreneurs, they became privileged. Uh, British middle class, they didn't have, or upper and middle class, they didn't have to work if they didn't want to, because they were actually inheriting huge chunks of, of money and estates. Contemporary consumption, this uh, basically, why don't we kind of jump back and actually make one more statement about Quaker business. Quaker business 
wasn't based on relationship, right? At one time, relationship, having a friend, having a trade partner, and hooking up with that person so that you could get good deals through that one person was very important. If you didn't have that sort of relationship, then you might get gypped, right? Quakers thought that that was dishonest. And so Quakers actually implemented something that was very important for later consumption, for later economics. They implemented a standardized price. I will sell you this for 50 cents because you're my friend, because I know you, actually because you've got a bit of God inside you, equality. This person over here that I don't know, I'm going to sell it to them for 50 cents as well. So it was that standardized price and the implementation, the use of, of their faith to implement a, a, a trading policy. And people liked it. This is where they get their, you know, they're honest traders. They're up front. They aren't going to sell something to you for one price, turn around and sell it to someone else for another price. And so they got a reputation for integrity. All right, this is why he shows up on the oatmeal box, okay? Because of that Quaker integrity. In systems of mass production, there is the potential for alienation. I don't know the person who made this jacket, right? You probably don't know the, persons that, the person that made any stitch of clothing on you. And with that disjunction between who produces the item and who consumes the item, there's lots of opportunity for abuse. You know, the sweatshop conditions that perhaps our clothing was made in. If we actually lived next to one of these shops, we would be outraged, I'm sure. But because there's this separation between the producer and the consumer, we're happily oblivious to the conditions in which the materials were made. Uh, so there's the potential for alienation in mass production. Also in advertising, uh, and this is going to the uh, James Carrier, in advertising, what an advertiser does is it, it appeals to a particular market. It appeals to a particular group of people that we think is going to buy this widget, all right? And we bombard them with images and with status and with, with you know, motivation to purchase and to consume an item. And so while they appeal to a market, they are also, <coughs> however, defining a market. They're actually creating a boundary around a group of people that may not exist in reality, there, whether it be a class, whether it be uh, a racial designation. There are going to be people that are in between those, those, those populations or those markets. And so this is, this is a process of objectifying households, OK? How many people are aware that, you know, that marketers will, will look at your zip code and there's a probability of you consuming a particular item because you live in a particular zip code area, all right? So they're going to market and they're going to advertise certain things. The way you click on advertisements in your, on your computer is another effective way that marketers are, okay, what is this person interested in? What are they going to potentially buy? And then we'll start putting the things that they potentially buy on their screen when they come to this website. They're objectifying you, all right? Just as, uh, to help you out, these are different shops, actually, that are available around the meeting house. Marks and Spencer, a uh, very, very British store, actually, uh, and also very upscale. In terms of quality of clothing, I think it would be kind of on par with, with say, J.C. Penney. Um, but it has a status in British society, and uh, it also sells food, and it's all prepackaged. It's very good for someone who's you know, you know, late from work, just going to grab something here, take it home, throw it in the microwave. It's very good stuff. But you, don't, you can't buy just an apple. It's an apple that's been wrapped in cellophane and has a little stickers on it and lots of things to market the uh, food uh, to the individual. There are also Tesco supermarkets. These are uh, basically very impersonal situations where the person will, because they don't normally say it, they'll have the, hi, my name is Mary, or welcome to Tesco's, my name is Mary, on their, on their shirt. But it's very impersonal. There isn't a, a necessary, an, it's an anonymous relationship, really. When you go to the grocery store, you buy a can of beans, you take it to the checkout counter, you drop some cash, you go, right? Uh, and then there are options here where it's a green grocer. 
You go, and if you go two or three times, the person recognizes you. If you go for months, the person knows you, okay? And here, it's important to stress the, re the individual relationship that forms. Rather posh, rather expensive, but also sensitive to global issues are grocery stores like Real Foods here that will sell fair trade items, organic items, things that are sensitive to the environment. The very first ever department store in the world is that one right there called Jenner's. Uh, that's where you can buy the Armani suits, you can buy the, and they also have very posh foods. What's funny is you could go and get a can of root beer there and it cost you like two pounds. It was outrageous. But I bought it because I was an American pining for home quite often. Also, allotments where people will go out and they have a garden. They live in the city, but they have a garden and they produce their own food for their own consumption or to give away as gifts. So these are all uh, opportunities that, that were available to Quakers. Consumption in clothing, uh, again, this is to kind of emphasize that Quakers don't use that Quaker great. You know what, there is a, there is a subgroup within the Society of Friends that uh, the, the New Foundation Fellowship, where they're trying to get Quakers to go back to Quaker gray where they're trying to get friends to actually go back to that traditional style of dress. And they, he was wearing a Quaker hat. It was a, there was a, they met at, in Edinburgh one day, and the one guy had his hat on a, on a coat rack, and I looked at it, and it was made in Texas. <laughs> and this guy was actually spending a lot of money to look awfully simple. Okay. But you'll notice a lot of this is actually age-related, that these people are wearing skirts, the bla uh, blazers. This is actually a Quaker wedding, okay? Now, they might be a little more formally dressed, but they aren't pe shelling out what the average wedding in the United States costs $10,000. That's average. What is it? 25. I heard, okay. Well, a photographer can anymore can cost you just five grand just like that. It's astonishing. Right, so this is, and these are the clothes that they would wear uh, at their worship service. How do they appropriate? All right. They won't go to Marks and Spencers. They won't go to Jenner's. Right? They tend to avoid Tesco's. What they want to do is they want to go to the green grocer. They'll go to this. This is the One World shop where they sell Cafe Direct tea and coffee. Actually, and they'll go to their allotments. They go to the Whole Foods stores. There's actually also a scheme. One person in the meeting house knows lots of organic fruit and vegetable growers. And for five dollars, you give her five bucks, and she'll bring you a bag of food every week. And she, they distribute it at the meeting house, and it might be—it's whatever is in, whatever's fresh at the moment. So, you get ten leeks. You know, you make lots of leek soup. Then, uh, you, you just get what's available. And so, uh, it's these sorts of things, and the establishment of relationships, and recognizing the relationship in others, that, that tends to be a, a priority. So they avoid the high-end markets, the uh, supermarkets, and they prefer small markets to establish relationships with a re retailer to address the individual. And then, of course, homegrown is preferred. When they make the soup on Sundays, if one person were to bring in beef bouillon soup, a lot of people would disappear because they're vegetarian. right? So no French onion soup if you want everybody to be a part of that community or a part of that, of that sharing. So they tend to go with organic, vegan, gluten-free is another sort of sensitive because uh, lots of people, or you might have uh, celiac disease and have an allergy to this, so you don't want to exclude anyone for that. Uh, they come together in group workshops where they'll make a reserve of lots of soup, and it's a great bonding time. It's fun to kind of hang out with friends, and they make tons of soup, soup, and they throw it in the freezer. So if anyone doesn't want to make soup on a particular Sunday, they can pull one of these out of the freezer, they can throw it in the, on the pot, turn it on, and while they're worshiping, it melts down and it becomes soup that they can eat afterwards. Uh, it's also an individual gift, where you'll see a lot of people that will prepare this, uh, usually from their own allotment garden, and they'll prepare a soup for, the, for mass consumption. 
it's following those ideas of simplicity. It's following those ideas that, that inform a Quaker identity. There was one instance where a group of young friends that were coming from all over Britain to stay at the meeting house and have uh, kind of a retreat, uh, they, as a favor, decided that they were going to make a Sunday meal for the meeting house. It was gorgeous. It was a pot roast with mashed potatoes and gravy. And, and it was a lot of young friends, but only about 10, 15 meeting participants because it wasn't following their understanding of what the Quaker faith and practice says of them. Okay? Is that cheese? That is cheese, yeah. So for, for your 30p, you get but fresh baked bread, soup, and cheese. cheese vegan. vegan. Well, many cheeses, no, they aren't. They do have vegan cheeses. Uh, actually, cheese, and that might be something that's skipped by a vegetarian. They'll take the, the lentil soup, but they won't take the cheese. Um, the rennet that's used in cheese is actually from the intestine of, uh, or the stomachs of cows. And so cheese is, you know, you learn all these sorts of rules when you, when you uh, are hanging around, <laughs> around Quakers that are vegetarian. You know, it's like, oh, well, you can have cheese then, can't you? And I was like, no, you can't, unless it says vegetarian cheese. And it may eliminate that rennet. Didn't you say that they got rid of things that cause addiction? In the beginning of your thing, you said, yeah. Why do they drink tea and coffee? Good question. I, the only thing that I can say is tea because they're British. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they were also, uh, it's, it's an innocent addiction. And they have, uh, in moderation, anything is the way they, at one time, they were the center, though, of the temperance movement. I mentioned root beer. This is a Quaker invention. They were selling root beer to, to try to get people off the real stuff. So they pick and choose which addiction's okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who doesn't? I know. But these are the good people, right? Yeah. Yep. They try. Yep. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So friends moralize commodities is my point here. All right? Friends mor and they use this framework in their choices of where and what they appropriate and consume, how they prepare it who they give it to. They do not use an idiom of good or evil in this, which is interesting. It isn't evil to eat French onion soup. Uh, they don't use that. They don't talk about people as though they're good or evil either. Everybody has the inner light within them. It's just whether or not they're paying attention to it uh, that they, they look at. This kind of puts them, when they put themselves into prisons, for instance, when they put themselves into prisons as, as uh, chaplains, they're very good. Uh, they're very good at looking at the individual as a human being and not as a monster. Very, very interesting. Commodities are avoided and modified to make them reflections of the individual and corporate identities through appropriation. All right. Giving possessions using the appropriate rules establishes social relations or community and modifies the behavior of the faithful. I found myself within a short period of time looking at the labels of food and recycling what I didn't normally. And, and it gets incorporated, a value system does get incorporated into, into a disposition, which is uh, an interesting process. I've only left a few minutes for questions, sorry. Yes? <clears throat> what kind of medical practices do you employ? Uh, very interesting. I, I mentioned that a uh, dear friend of mine was the head of the medical school at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, lots of these people were, it was a very, very uh, affluent group. Lots of, lots of medical doctors, two or three, uh, two pediatricians. Uh, so they embraced uh, Western medicine. Uh, but there's also healers in the group as well who will use Tibetan singing bowls as a, as a healing process and, and laying of hands. They're happy with just about anything. They're very pragmatic as a, as a corporate entity. Yes? What is the racial makeup of, of, of the group that you study? I'm sorry? The racial makeup. Well, uh, there were, thank you, considerable Basically, it was Caucasian. Uh, Edinburgh is a very middle class and very Caucasian city. 
but there was one person who was from Pakistan, uh, and there were, uh, whenever a Quaker family from Africa was in town, usually associated with the university, they would come to meeting for worship there as well. But it was really, and it was also, and I didn't have time to go into this, incredibly middle class. Uh, and it is a reification, and this goes into Carrier a little more. It's a, a, a replication of the middle class in many ways. Yeah, good question. Yeah. What about the consumption of, of alcohol and stuff like that? Uh, the first time, I, this is anecdotal. The first time I ever drank to the point of vomiting was with a Quaker. <laughs> okay. It's it's in moderation. They allow they allow they allow people to sit and have a glass of wine that isn't uh, that isn't seen as as taboo or wrong or evil. Uh, but there were there would have been a lot of older friends that if they found out what Alex and I had done. They would have looked down their nose at it. They would have, you know, do what you think you must, sort of thing. <laughs> kind of use your own your own sense of guilt to control your behavior. <laughs> Any other? No. Well, gosh, thanks, and thank you, Anthropology Club, for letting me do this.